William Tyndale has been called the Apostle of England, and by some, one of the finest men who ever lived. He was a man loved by those who loved God, but hated and hunted by Rome, because he was the first to translate the Bible from Greek into English. He was ultimately betrayed by a trusted friend and then imprisoned for a time before being strangled and burned at the stake in a place called Vilvord. There are no many people here in Vilvord who know who are William Tyndale. They are, they've forgotten him. <laughs> Vilvord is located just north of Brussels in Belgium. While most people there have no idea who Tyndale was. Do you know who William Tyndale is? Tyndale. You know who William Tyndale was? I just uh, told him. Oh, you he, just told he, him? Yeah, I just had that conversation. Oh, sorry. Still, there are some who keep his memory alive. A grim stone monument bears his name, along with a bronze plaque of his likeness. Elsewhere in the town is a local Protestant church that also houses the Tyndale Museum. What does this say? Uh, Lord, speak because your servant listens. It is from Samuel 3, verses 10. Here, the curator tells us the important role played by William Tyndale in the development of the English Bible and the Protestant Reformation. In 1517, he was consecrated as priest. That's one thing. In the same year, Martin Luther nailed his 95 propositions on the little church of Wittenberg. Tyndale was influenced by the example of Luther, along with John Wycliffe and those who had come before, who desired to communicate the gospel to the common man. But from the time of Pope Innocent, it had been declared by Rome that, as by the old law, the beast touching the holy mount was to be stoned to death. So simple and uneducated men were not to touch the Bible or venture to preach its doctrines. In Tyndale's time, England was still a Catholic country and the priests communicated the mass only in Latin, a language the common people could not understand. While Tyndale knew Latin, he desired to know Greek also, so he could better understand the scripture. He went to the University of Oxford, and in 1515, he had already had his Master of Arts. But he wanted to be a the 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 theologist. And because uh, in Oxford, everything was in Latin, he went to Cambridge because in Cambridge they teach also Greek. Why uh, Erasmus, the well-known Erasmus, who translated the New Testament in Greek, uh, but that was forbidden to read, mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, teach there in Greek. Some think Erasmus may have taught Tyndale directly, while others think Tyndale arrived at Cambridge shortly after Erasmus departed. In either case, it was at Cambridge that Tyndale's conflict with Rome seems to have begun. A young Tyndale spoke out against Cardinal Wolsey, a powerful clergyman who was also the Lord Chancellor of England in the court of King Henry VIII. Sir Wolsey visited the University of Cambridge, but he was with a golden ring, golden, uh, it was very, uh, and William Tyndale shout out that it was a shame that the clergyman lived in such a wealth and the and poor people are so poor, they even don't understand what they say, they, do, they don't know uh, any word in, in, in Latin. The chancellor went away very angry. He was chased from the Cambridge, but he came by John Welch in Little Sodbury. 
Tyndale was convicted that it was impossible to establish the lay people in any truth except ye scripture were plainly laid before their eyes in their mother tongue. Some believe it was at Little Sodbury where he began his translation of the New Testament. He started translating, I believe, at Little Sodbury Manor where he had that horrible run-in with uh, uh, the Catholic priest because uh, Sir John Walsh, the knight there, would invite the Catholic prelates and the high uh, church officials there. And Tyndall was the teacher of his children and the pastor of his church that was behind his house at the time. And as they were eating dinner one time, uh, they began talking and and uh, every time the priest would say something, Tyndall would say, well, the word says this. And he'd say, well, the word said this. And the, the, the guy finally got mad and said, we would be better to be without God's law than the Pope's law. Tyndale, in his great zeal, spoke against what he saw as blasphemy. He famously declared, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere these many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than thou dost. Tyndale got in real big trouble for that. Uh, tells us in Fox's Book of Martyrs that he had to appear before the local uh, religious officials, ecclesiastical officials, and it says they, they berated him as though he were a dog. <laughs> and so, but Tyndale had the burning desire to get uh, the scriptures into the language that the plowboy could read because as he would be up in his little room at Little Sodbury Manor there, he'd look out across the Severn Valley and he would see the plowboys plowing the field and he knew that unless uh, they could read the scriptures, they wouldn't come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that was his driving force to get the scripture out so that people could read it and come to know Christ. For Tyndale, his declaration about the plowboy was not spoken in vain, but would become his life's work, for which he would be hated and persecuted by Rome. As the Apostle Paul had written, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We have William Tyndall being burned uh, uh, because uh, he claimed that salvation was by grace through faith. He claimed that uh, praying to the saints did no good. Uh, he affirmed that uh, people needed the Bible in their own language, and so they defrocked him. And um, they did show him some some mercy, if you can can call it mercy, because they strangled him before they burned him. Inquisitors find he was innocent. And therefore, before burning him on the burn stake, they strangled him. This is the approximate location where Tyndale was killed, outside the castle at Vilvord. While the castle itself has since been destroyed, the Tyndale Museum has a model of what it would have looked like on display. They have also built a replica of the prison cell where Tyndale was kept. While paintings of him in captivity present an almost romantic prison setting, the reality seems to have been quite different. The replica was made to scale and is the same size as the one in which Tyndale was held for some 16 months before his execution. I show you a copy of his prison, how he was prisoned.
Now, is it believed that the room was this small? Yes. Yes, certainly. Because the restored correction uh, that, that is built with the stones of the old castle, and there are our cells, they are not bigger as this. Here he sleeps, and there was his uh, toilet. But it was very, very empty, uh, very, very cold here. Centuries later, and debates continue about Tyndale's life and death. The European Institute of Protestant Studies even believes that Tyndale was not fully killed by strangulation and continued to suffer while being burned alive. There is even contention about exactly why he was put to death. The only mistake he did that he didn't recognize the Pope as chief of the church of the, of the Catholic Church. Why was William Tyndale put to death? What's the real history? I suppose essentially because he translated the Bible into English and there was a strong feeling that the Bible shouldn't be translated into the vernacular, shouldn't be translated into English. Um, he also fell foul of Henry VIII um, from a point where he supported Henry's move towards becoming supreme head of the church. Tyndale moved into opposition to Henry's divorce. Um, he was put to death ostensibly because he was a heretic, because there was great unease about making the Bible available in English where everybody could read it and get, have their own personal relationship with God rather than paying attention to the hierarchy of the church, um, being under the authority of their betters, as it were. There is no question but that the politics of England at this time were complicated. King Henry VIII, went to great lengths to achieve an annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. The term red tape is said to have originated from all the red seals Henry had obtained in his petition to the Pope. While Henry would eventually cast off the papacy and make himself the temporal head of the Church of England, at heart his loyalties were much toward Rome. So much so, that he was once cautioned about giving too much honor to the Pope, to which he replied, there is no such thing as giving too much honor to the Pope. Henry's Lord Chancellor of England at this time was Sir Thomas More, who would become the chief opponent of William Tyndale and his Bible. Sainted by Rome for his undying loyalty to the papacy, More called Tyndale a beast and a hellhound in the kennel of the devil. All in all, Moore wrote nine books against Tyndale, filling more than a thousand pages with arguments and invective against the reformer, and always defending the ultimate authority of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. When King Henry made his break with Rome, Thomas More was condemned as a traitor and put to death because of his continued allegiance to the Pope. This may be why Pope John Paul II, in the year 2000, named Saint Thomas More the heavenly patron of statesmen and politicians. This declaration was made on October 31st, which is known as Reformation Day in parts of Europe, the anniversary of the day when Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door at Wittenberg. Could this have been intended as a modern day insult to the Reformation? Some Protestants in Europe found More's patron sainthood disturbing because Sir Thomas More not only hated Tyndale and spent years trying to hunt him down, but also had a number of his followers tortured and burned to death for heresy. Moore even had his Chelsea home equipped with stocks and a whipping tree, so he could interrogate heretics himself. Moore had written, and for heretics as they be, the clergy doth denounce them, and as they be well worthy, the temporality doth burn them, and after the fire of Smithfield, 
hell doth receive them, where the wretches burn forever. Protestant historians to this day believe it was Moore who orchestrated Tyndale's betrayal and execution. But in the end, Tyndale's final prayer would overcome his opponents. Before he died, he famously cried out, sadness of all this story is that six months after the death of William Tyndale, the king ordered Miles Coverdale to translate the Bible in English. And therefore he used the Bible, the translation that William Tyndale had made. To this day, men believe that God answered the prayer of Tyndale. Not only would King Henry authorize the translation of an English Bible for the first time in history, but Tyndale's work as a translator would go on to influence nearly every English Bible that would follow. Tyndale has a very large impact that's still with us today. I think the most uh, obvious quotation is, let there be light, which is often used. Um, the one that I like best is the powers that be, which of course occurred in a quite different context. Um, Tyndale's is the first widely disseminated translation of the Bible into English. William Tyndale, in his 1526 New Testament, was the one who laid the foundation for the English language as we, as we know it today. Tyndale's giving English to the English, if you like, um, and he's pr it, because his Bible is printed and it's been widely disseminated. It's helping the language to develop. And the Bible became the most read book because previously uh, it was uh, anathema. You couldn't read it. The common man couldn't read it. So it helped people to learn to read. While previous Bibles were very large and kept in churches, the idea of Tyndale's Bible was to make it smaller in size so that a person could carry it with them wherever they went. Because most of Tyndale's Bibles were destroyed by the Inquisition, only a few copies remain. One of them is at the British Library in London. Our copy is um, a very pretty book. It's also a very important book in terms of it, its, its language, because although it was printed in 1526, it's so familiar to us still today because it survives in the language of later copies of the Bible, notably the King James Bible of 1611, with which it's usually exhibited in our treasures gallery here to actually, so that people can draw a comparison between the language of the two versions that are nearly 100 years apart in printing. Before his death, Tyndale would also be the first to translate much of the Old Testament from Hebrew into English, including the first five books of Moses, then from Joshua to Second Chronicles and the book of Jonah. While he was not able to finish his Old Testament translation, all his material became the basis of what was called the Great Bible, commissioned by Henry VIII, and the basis for the Geneva Bible that would be known as the Bible of the Reformation. Modern scholars using computer technology even believe that some 83% of the King James Bible was based on the work of William Tyndale. What follows are just a few of the well-known biblical phrases that come directly from his translation. Let there be light. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The signs of the times. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went out and wept bitterly. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, in him we live, move and have fight the good fight be not weary in well-doing and looking unto jesus 
the author and finisher of our faith. This is, this is the current facsimile of the Tyndale New Testament, and it's approximately the same size as the original, um, perhaps just a little bit bigger. Um, you need a big pocket for this. The, the original is definitely a pocket book. Okay. Let's have a look. Um, he produces a wonderful translation of the New Testament. The issue is a, a pocket book of the Bible. That's the idea of your own Bible. Um, is so familiar to people, but Tyndale is, is the man who sort of got there first. Given that Tyndale's um, Bible was ordered to be burnt and we've only got three copies left, it's amazing that we have what's almost a complete copy left and that it's so beautifully decorated in this way. It was somebody's prized possession. Um, I have to say, I think it's a very beautiful book. Um, it's a very touching book and it's a very important volume it's, it's, uh, the whole thing comes together. You can see why it's such an attractive story to people. It's the word of God, something that people prize, and it's a precious object, and it's a very rare object and a very special object associated with a, a remarkable man. To this day, some scholars still consider William Tyndale to have been the single best of all the English translators. But his enemies fought hard against him, burning his Bibles and burning those who dared to read them. Furthermore, the Bishop of London, Cuthbert Tunstall, along with Sir Thomas More, declared that Tyndale, the so-called hellhound, had thousands of errors in his Bible. Tyndale's reply was, I call God to record against the day we shall appear before our Lord Jesus that I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience, nor would do this day if all that is in earth, whether it be honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given me. Tyndale knew the importance of men knowing the true words of God, because Jesus said, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him on the last day.